From our new home in the heart of Southwest Florida, this is We View 26. Live from the We View News Center in the heart of Southwest Florida, this is the first news at five with Joe Larkins, Kate Brewington, Jack Church with First Weather, and Mike Cannington with First Sports. Good afternoon. Embattled evangelist Jimmy Swaggart is defying national church leaders, saying that he plans to return to the pulpit in May in accordance with the less strict punishment handed down by a state church group. And that's prompted criticism from some Assemblies of God leaders, including one in Fort Myers. We have News Center's Ron Elkia standing by live in our Fort Myers newsroom with details. Ron? Well, Swaggart says he wants to begin preaching again, even though church leaders are trying to punish him for allegedly paying a prostitute to pose nude for him. A local Assemblies of God leader says Swigert's decision is disappointing. Assemblies of God leaders yesterday had ordered Swigert out of the pulpit and off the air for one year. Today, a spokesman said Swigert plans to instead to abide by a decision of the denomination's you know, Louisiana district, which had imposed a three-month preaching ban. He is looking forward with great anticipation to returning to television and to the pulpit in accordance with the district's decision on Sunday, May 22, 1988. That decision is irresponsible, according to the Reverend Dan Betzer, pastor of the First Assembly of God in Fort Myers, and the national radio voice of the Assemblies of God. He's not only going against the, the conscience of the Assemblies of God, but he's going against what he himself has preached and written. Indeed, in an article in last August's issue of the Swigert Ministries magazine, the TV evangelist wrote, Church leadership must be above reproach. Sin should be dealt with relentlessly. Swigert also agreed with the church's policy that fallen churchmen can't preach for one year and in the second year may preach only under supervision. And what if Swigert does return to television? Anyone who thinks whether he's a Christian or a non-Christian is going to have to remember all that's happened. There are terrible wages for sin. doesn't matter who commits it, whether it's myself or Jimmy Swigert or anybody. Now, if Swigert does return to TV in May, as he says he plans to do, he would be dismissed from the Assemblies of God. But he still could start his own ministry, something his spokesman said today is a possibility. Now, the Reverend Betzer told me he doesn't know how far Swigert would get. Kate and Joe? Thank you, Ron. Ron Elke reporting live from our Fort Myers newsroom. Well, the growing crime rate in Florida is behind new efforts to require a cooling off period for the purchase of handguns. There's talk of a new bill which would call for a seven day wait, but as Kim Allen tells us, many feel it would be ineffective. At present, only the Miami area requires a cooling off period for handguns, wherein the purchaser must wait two days to take his gun home. But if the state legislature passes a proposed bill, everyone purchasing a handgun must wait seven days to take the weapon home. The main purpose is to prevent crimes of passion. That's why it's called a cooling off period. The Collier County Commissioner Arnold Lee Glass, who is a candidate for sheriff, says it would be ineffective in stopping crime. I guarantee it. If it has the function of providing a check on the individual from a criminal point of view for a police check or something, then it could be beneficial. Without those checks and just the fact to cool off without having a weapon immediately available, it's not very beneficial. Others say a cooling off period would deter criminals trying to purchase guns. But at least one Naples gun shop owner says enforcing the seven day cooling off period would be next to impossible. Any dealer can mark on the bill of sale that uh, you ordered this gun uh, 10 days ago. And they can mark on their deposit paid uh, January 1st and the balance paid January 20th. And there's no way that somebody can prove otherwise. But gun control proponents maintain it's just too easy to get a gun. They say some kind of restriction is better than none at all. In Collier County, Kim Allen, Media News Center 26. The proposed bill did receive some national support. Sarah Brady, the wife of White House Press Secretary James Brady. He, you may recall, was critically wounded in an assassination attempt on the president seven years ago. Two Southwest Florida men charged with the 1984 drug-related murder of a Collier County man have entered not guilty pleas. Robert Easterly was the first to appear in Collier County Circuit Court today. He and Gerald Scott were indicted for the shooting death of Robert Garber. Garber's bullet-riddled body was found in a remote area of South Lee County. Easterly and Scott's trials are tentatively set to begin May 31st. 
One of the people arrested yesterday for last November's kidnapping and robbery of a pharmacist is now facing additional charges. James Wilkes is being charged by the Lee County Sheriff's Department with two counts of armed robbery, two counts of bringing a firearm into a pharmacy, and one count of kidnapping. Wilkes and another man, Harold Johnson, allegedly committed one of those robberies in January. Wilkes is the only one being charged for a second robbery in March. Yesterday, James Wilkes and Iris Wilkes were arrested by the Fort Myers Police department. They are charged with kidnapping Joe Richards last November and forcing him to empty the safe of his Broadway pharmacy. The city of Naples is trying to force a businessman to stop selling fuel at the Naples Municipal Airport. However, as WeView News Center's Don Gourmet's reports, despite a court order, the businessman is still selling fuel and that's left some airport officials fuming. Z Air is the only company at Naples Municipal Airport that doesn't buy its fuel from the airport authority. Owner Mike Anastasia says that's why the airport authority went to court to shut him down. Yesterday, a judge told Anastasia his lease doesn't allow for fueling. He said because it didn't say anything about a fuel truck, that was the reason that he felt that the truck shouldn't be parked there. Anastasia says he saves $10,000 a month pumping his own fuel, but Judge Ted Brousseau yesterday said the truck had to go. Anastasia told the judge he'd moved the truck, but hasn't so far. Today, the airport authority got tough. Authority members at a special meeting today told their attorney to file contempt of court charges if Anastasia doesn't move the truck by Friday. He seemed to uh, say, or should we say, thumb his nose at us each time, so we still have to run the airport the way we want to run the airport, not the way he wants to run the airport. Anastasia says he'll move his truck, but he still plans on continuing his court fight to keep pumping his own fuel. In Naples, Don Gourmet's Weave You News Center 26. Anastasia says his attorneys are trying to determine if the airport authority has the legal right to limit fuel sales at the airport. The search for that F-16 that crashed into the Gulf is about to resume. The Navy's salvage ship, the USS Grasp, pulled into Port Manatee today and is expected to be at the crash site by tonight. If anything is located, members of the investigative board will be brought on board before an effort to retrieve the debris is made. And coming up, Southwest Florida Regional Medical Center may soon be adding a new surgical procedure to their services. And Dr. Dean Adele says go ahead and indulge once in a while. The first organ transplant program in Southwest Florida is off the drawing board and in the hands of state officials for consideration today. As we use Donna Howell explains, a local hospital thinks it's growing in the right direction. By November, a life-saving kidney transplant will be only as far away as Southwest Florida Regional Medical Center. A year later, heart transplants will be possible here. It seems as a natural evolution of what we're already doing. We have a very active dialysis program. We've, we've performed dialysis procedures here for years. Our open heart surgery program is one of the premier programs in the state. Last year, 26 kidney patients and a dozen heart patients were forced to go to out-of-town hospitals because transplants weren't available nearby. Right now, the closest transplant centers are in Miami and Tampa. Bringing that service closer to home makes not only monetary sense, it's a lot easier for the patients and the family. It's not unusual that the, the proposed recipient may have to wait a week, two weeks, sometimes a month before an organ becomes available. If they're doing that from Tampa, makes it just that much more uh, logistically difficult. State approval of the organ transplant program is due in mid-July. Then Southwest Florida Regional will begin training its transplant staff. After that, it won't be long until the life-saving program is up and operating. In Lee County, Donna Howell, Weview News Center 26. Expect to see some new things coming from Southwest Florida Regional Medical Center. The hospital is getting ready to enlarge several departments and add a new emergency center as well. In other medical news, doctors tell us it's vital to cut fat out of your daily diets to lower the risk of heart disease. However, it now appears you can cheat on that diet occasionally and still be fine. Dr. Dean Adell has this report. If you had to pick one thing, one part of your diet to cut back on to reduce the risk of cancer, heart disease, or just to lose weight, it would have to be fats. It seems every government report, every medical study tells us that much. But it's one thing to start out on a diet like that, quite another to stick with it. Sometimes temptation gets the best of us and boom, there goes the diet. But guess what, folks? It turns out an occasional holiday, wedding, or even bar mitzvah we can live with. 
The doctors took a group of normal men, put them on an average American diet for around three weeks, average around 40% fat. Then they put them on the American Heart Association recommended low-fat diet, around 25% fat. That's another three weeks. Now, the volunteers' blood fat levels and cholesterol levels went down significantly. That's not news. But for the final three weeks, listen to this. The subjects were allowed to eat a ham and cheese sandwich and a high butter fat milkshake, about the worst thing you could possibly imagine if you wanted to lose weight, every other day. The researchers found that there was little change when the low-fat diet was interrupted by a splurge meal on alternate days. The key here is the low-fat diet. Stick to it, and you can cheat once in a while and still keep your blood fats where you want them. I'm Dr. Dina Dell. <laughs> <laughs> we voices. want weather watchers. We still want weather watchers, right? That's right. Another we, one. we still have one opening. We had lots of phone calls today on the Cape Coral opening we've got, but still at Marco Island. If you live there, don't complain about your weather observations. Why don't you apply for the job we've got open, okay? <laughs> sounds like a great idea. All you do, if you'd like to be the weather watcher on Marco Island, we need a relief person down there. We'll send you a rain gauge and high-low thermometer and talk with you daily. You need to be a permanent resident. Give us a call at our Lee County line, 597-6038, and we'll talk about it, okay? So, Sounds somebody good. on Marco needs to give us a call. You want to look at the uh, guest weather picture They're now? They're always beautiful. All right, got one of those from Bob Emmons, Jr. Now, Bob lives in Naples, and he shows us a nice sunrise mosquito control flyover in East Naples. Thank you, Bob. Now, let's show you the temperatures. Thank you to Bob Emmons for his guest weather picture. Also, I want to mention that phone number for Marco Island. That's a Collier County line. You should know that, so give me a call. There's the address, of course, to send in your pictures as well. Another fine day in southwest Florida, and right now still looks pretty good. In Fort Myers and Cape Coral, it's warm at 81 degrees. High was 86, morning low 66, your humidity 49%. We got a few spritzes of rain around the area, but nothing officially at Page Field. Naples Golden Gate, 78, had a little sprinkle pass through the area. Sea breeze cools it down as well. After a high of 85, the low was 64, 68% humidity. And in Port Charlotte and Punta Gorda, Charlotte County, nice this day, uh, 81 right now. High 84, morning low 65. Let's talk a little bit about rainfall. We could use some. Now, so far in the month of March, we've officially measured just over two and a half inches. And now for 1988, if we get my name off there, we can see we've had about a six and a quarter inches of rainfall officially measured at Page Field. Now, a lot of folks may think we're a lot too dry. That's the reason we've had the brush fires. But you got to remember, this is the dry season in southwest Florida. And our average rainfall for the three-month total is actually 6.8 inches. So we're only about a half inch off of that total. But with some luck, maybe we'll get a little more during these afternoon thunder showers that will be popping up from time to time. Large area of high pressure continues to be the thing that's influencing our weather, keeping us very warm and keeping this big weather system back out to our west. Well, just keeping it out there. Now, for us, during the afternoon, a few clouds have again developed today. And let's go to live radar. We'll show you a couple of showers out there as well. Here they are out uh, around the mouth of the Calusa Hatchie. We've seen a few in across South Lee County and just off Naples and off Naples Beach and Marco Island, a few out there. But they're the hit and miss variety and not expecting a lot and most of that activity will be over in the next couple of hours. Very warm temperatures on the weather network today. Marco Island had 87 degrees. Sanibel was up to 88. Now uh, Fort Myers Beach, Gene and Diane Steffen reported 89 and Charlie Evans with that east wind blowing hit 90 at Boca Grande and the Whackers had that same 90 in North Cape Coral. And there's another 90 for you. St. James City, John Newspickle with that report. The upper airflow continues to be for us coming from the south, and that's going to keep us warm, looks like right on through the end of the week. And you can see, as for that cold front that's generating the rain here, well, it's not moving. It's going to stall out right there, and we'll stay under the influence of that high pressure 
You can see tomorrow continues partly cloudy. Our temperature is going to be about 85 degrees, so another warm day. Now our boaters, uh, you're going to need to use some caution. The southeast wind out over the open gulf will pick up at 14 to 18 knots. So the waves tomorrow at 4 to 7 feet. The tides on Sanibel, high tides at 11.26 a.m. and 11.30 p.m. Now our forecast tonight, one or two isolated showers out there, but otherwise just a fair mild night, lows in the 60s. And on Thursday, partly cloudy, continued very, very warm with highs in the middle to upper 80s. And of course, as always, chance for an afternoon shower, but very isolated possibilities. Okay, well. The, the, these are thunderstorms you're talking about? No, just showers. showers. Just, just showers. little thunder okay. showers. That's all it is. Don't worry about them. <laughs> no. Uh, Thanks, Jack. Okay. Thanks, Jack. Another off day for the stock market. The Dow closed down over 20 points with over 152 million shares changing hands. Standard Poor's was also down to close at 258.07. And on the metals exchange, gold and silver were both up. It's time once again for a Money Minute. With me is Justin McLaughlin of AG Edwards and Sons of Naples. Today's topic, combination annuities. Justin, this is a complicated subject, so I'm going to let you explain. Joe, many people in southwest Florida use the savings on their investments to supplement their income. But there is an investment that can defer the taxes they pay on those earnings. The combination annuity, which is actually two annuities, one immediate and one deferred. Here's how it works. You split your deposit between a deferred and an immediate annuities in these amounts. $14,587.26 is put into a deferred annuity for seven years at 8% and it grows back to $25,000. On the immediate side, your monthly income of $157.75 is generated each month for seven years. During that period, 78.5% of that is tax excluded, so you only pay taxes on $406.05 each year. One last note about combination annuities, there is a 10% IRS penalty if you make a withdrawal from the deferred annuity before the age of 59 and a half, which makes this an effective investment for retirees. Justin, why are the payments 78% tax excluded? Because it's a return of your principal. It's your money coming back to you. And an additional benefit of this investment is that these dollars are not included in the tax calculation for Social Security income. So this investment can ease the taxes on your Social Security payments. Okay, thank you, Justin. Next week's topic, tax sheltered income. And coming up in sports, spring training baseball is quickly coming to an end. Mike Cannington has highlights of the Texas Rangers game in Sarasota, plus a look at the finalists in this year's NIT basketball tournament and how they got to the big game tonight. Here it is. We're still in March Madness, and you're wanting to talk football. Football. Just briefly, I want to touch on this because it's sort of ludicrous. You know, it'd be what I'm going to talk to you about would be like knowing who was going to win the Miss America pageant before the thing ever got started, right? <laughs> or knowing who was going to win the NIT championship tonight before the game ever took place. I can't stand it. We've got almost a month to go before the National Football League's annual draft, but as of now, there is no suspense over who the first player chosen will be. The Atlanta Falcons own that pick. Falcons coach Marion Campbell said today that Auburn linebacker Andre Bruce will be his team's choice. So much for the drama, intrigue, and flair that goes into a draft. Contract negotiations are set to begin immediately. Well, Big East versus Big Ten, there is no knowing who's going to win this one tonight, but there is some consolation for backers of these two college basketball powerhouse conferences. One of them will win the National Invitation Tournament tonight in New York at Madison Square Garden. The Connecticut Huskies, with the worst record of any Big East 10 in postseason play, are the only conference reps still alive going up against Ohio State. At the Garden last night, Connecticut had to rally in the second half against the Big East Boston College. Jeff King scoring here as the crowd cheers. Steve Pickell will connect once again. Watch him on the three-point line. He'll drain that one to give Connecticut the lead. BC's Beasley scores to pull the Eagles to within three of UConn, but down the stretch, Cliff Robinson hits a late shot to seal the game. Connecticut advances with a 73-67 win. At halftime, we made a couple adjustments, both uh, physiologically and psychologically, about the level of intensity you need to play at Dan Barrows. And uh, second half, we come out, we just flat out played. Well, meanwhile, Ohio State survived a squeaker over Colorado State. Tony White getting the bucket here inside. Trent Shippen kept the Colorado State Rams in the game with three-point shooting like that. But Jay Burson will come up with a steal right here as he ignited a second-half rally. 16 of his 18 points in the second half. Ohio State wins at 64-62. basket. Uh, we were able to get inside a little bit the first half, which kept us close. Uh, 
And in the second half, it seemed like uh, we came out and we're a little sluggish again. Uh, and uh, they were trying to slow us down, hit a couple shots and got ahead of us. We called timeout. And and from then on, uh, it seemed like our press kind of took over a little bit, got them to, to, sh to shoot the ball a little quick the way that we wanted them to do it and, and got the tempo up a little bit. Okay, so the finals tonight, Ohio State and Connecticut will have highlights for you on the Sports Center at 11. The Texas Rangers took to the road for their final game of the spring against the Chicago White Sox, a team they've played five times so far. At Payne Field in Sarasota, Bobby Valentine's squad went up 1-0 in the first. Then Pete O'Brien with Scott Fletcher on second. O'Brien launches one into the right field corner. It's not a home run, but bounces off the fence for a double. Larry Parrish, the next man up, sends what looks like an easy fly ball, but watch what Lance Johnson does. Oh, Joe, you should get out there and give the guy a little help on how to feel the ball. Melito Perez, brother of Pasquale I-285, Perez on the mound for Chicago, retired 12 batters at one point, but unfortunately for Chicago, they lose this game 5-4 to four today, Texas with a win. On the Grapefruit League schedule, it is 6-1, to one, Montreal over Los Angeles, and Boston with the like score over Cincinnati. New York Mets by one over Atlanta. It is Pittsburgh by four over St. Louis, 6-2, to two, Toronto 4-2 to two over Detroit, and Philadelphia 5-1. to one over Kansas City. And a little something coming up for you tonight. We're going to have highlights of a blind softball game. You might not think the blind can play, but we're going to show you how they do it. I look forward to it. Great. Thank Thanks. You, and still ahead, tomorrow marks the end of an important season here in Southwest Florida. We'll tell you all about it when we return. Tomorrow marks the end of the manatee season in Southwest Florida. The season, which begins in mid-November, is the time when manatees migrate into warmer waters and are more vulnerable to boats. For environmentalists and conservationists who belong to Manatee Alert, the season has been successful. The 400-member group established a hotline a few months ago, and since then they've received over 1,000 reports of manatee sightings. Manatee Alert will be honoring some of its volunteers at an awards banquet tomorrow night. Review TV is among those being honored for the Manatee Alert run during our weather forecast. And tonight at 11 on WeView News, Lorene Jew will introduce you to some of the volunteers who help make the program work. And that's our report for now. Stay tuned for entertainment tonight and a current affair followed by World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. And we'll see you back here at 11. Good night. Good night.